Genesis chapter 40, verse 21, the Bible says, And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So that's self-explanatory, is that Pharaoh was able to restore the chief butler back to his position of being a butler again. And the butler was able to once more give the cup, serve the cup to Pharaoh's hand. Verse 22, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. However, the chief of the bakers didn't have it so well. He was hanged by Pharaoh. All of this went accordingly as Joseph interpreted the dreams. Now, remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word uh, from the verses. So if your eyes are on the verses as I explain them, you're in the right place, okay? So if you want to fall asleep in my teaching and try to dodge it and pretend you're like reading the Bible, then you're doing a good job, all right? So just <laughs> keep up the good work, okay? So you're doing the right thing. Verse 23, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. Well, that's uh, pretty lame. Remember, Joseph said to the chief butler, uh, remember me uh, when you go back to your position and put in a good word to Pharaoh for me because I was unfairly imprisoned here. And then what happens is that the verse says, in spite of Joseph interpreting the dream to them, the chief butler did not remember Joseph. That's really sad. Yeah. Chief Butler did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. All right, chapter 41 and verse 1. Chapter 41, and we'll read verse 1. It says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. So, uh, and it came to pass is a favorite uh, phrase that you see, figure of speech that you see throughout the author uh, of Genesis using it. Basically, it just so happened later on that when two full years passed by, when it ended, so that's how long the butler forget, forgot Joseph. Now, that is a real horrible thing. Yeah, horrible. Now, you would think that you would never do that, but, you know, when the Lord and, your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ saved your life, you put him on a shelf for quite a number full of years too, don't you? Okay, but anyway... That's besides the point, all right? Thank God, right? So I get back to the point for you. Uh, Pharaoh, he was dreaming. And when he dreamed, lo and behold, what did he see? He was standing by the river. So he was standing by the river here. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat flesh. So lo and behold, what came out of the river is seven... Goodly, that's the idea about well-favored. They are favored well. Goodly, uh, kind. So these are cows right here. And they are fat flesh. They are fed very well. Their flesh is very fat. And they fed in a meadow. So uh, they were being fed by a meadow here. Now, obviously your King James Bible is not perfect. And it has errors, according to the critics. So instead of meadow, then uh, they'll put it as reeds or bulrushes or something, because this is Egypt. That's the idea. So there's no such thing as a meadow in Egypt. But the problem uh, with their uh, thinking is that if you look up the word meadow, now this is very important to understand. So we're going to be covering a lot of archaic words here in this chapter. The King James Bible, it is written in Old English, so it is written in Archaic English. Now, I'm going to establish several arguments why we should retain the words in our King James Bible. We don't have to modernize it to today's language. Well, so I'm going to explain why that's the case. Wouldn't it be simpler if we do it that way? It might be simpler to you, but to be quite honest, it won't be as simple as you think. That's what I'm going to argue and show you later on. But the idea is, when you have these kinds of words, all you have to do is go to etymology online, just Google search that, and then go over there and then type in the word and then the definition's right there. Mm -hmm. Webster's 1828 dictionary is free online. Just pull that word up and then you'll find the definition. If you have a dictionary in your home, there might be a good chance that when they have the word, they'll define it from uh, archaic English. And if not, it's everything's free on the internet. Mm -hmm. So you'd be surprised. Just type down the word and then you'll find the definition. 
And then you'll find out it's not really an error. Here's a, you know how you can beat Greek and Hebrew scholars? You would be surprised. You would be surprised. Because when you search high and low for uh, a lexicon or a Greek and Hebrew word to see if the King James Bible can be justified, a lot of times you may not find it. And then the people will go, well, hence, there's an error in your King James Bible. But, uh, hey, stupid, you have to realize you're not reading Greek and Hebrew, you're reading English. Right. So you're looking at the wrong dictionary. You don't look at a Greek and Hebrew dictionary, dummy, because the KJV translator didn't give you a Greek and Hebrew word here. They were giving you an English word. So the smart thing to do would be to look at an King James English type of dictionary. Yep. Why would they use that English word? Not why would they use that Greek and Hebrew word. They did it because <laughs> they're translating to English. So, hey, dummy, you ever thought about just look up that English word and you'd be surprised uh, one of the definitions for that one word would match to the Greek and Hebrew definition. You'd be surprised. Whoa, oh, what, 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 oh, duh, you know? Now, why do I talk like that? Because I want to show you how easy it is to justify a meaning or a word in the King James Bible and that you don't have to be some PhD Greek and Hebrew scholar and these guys who act like PhDs when actually it is so simpleton, they are actually very simpletons and it's so stupid the arguments that they pull up when they never thought about, oh, it's in English not Greek and Hebrew, and they have the audacity when this is the word of God that should be serious, that should be retained as much as possible, they have the audacity to throw out any Greek and Hebrew and change that word. Mm -hmm. See, that's a very serious thing. Wow. That's a very serious thing. They should have thought twice, you know, have they thought about this was in English? <laughs> they got to pull up a dictionary. Before they learn a different language that's not, their, uh, that's not their own tongue, they should learn their own tongue that they were born with. You know, that's their mother tongue. They should learn their own tongue that they were born with, their own mother tongue, before they go off, uh, learn some foreign language, uh, foreign language and pretend that they're smarter than you when they don't even know their own words, their own language that they were born with. Okay, going back. So Meadow, the idea is... is going to match up the same ideas. It's like a pasture. That's the idea. Because when you look at a meadow, it's like similar to a pasture or a place, uh, a grassy spot where they can eat. It's just that simple. Okay? It's just that simple. Now, when you look at verse 3, and behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river. So then, lo and behold, what happens is seven other Cows come up after the fat ones, and they come up out of the river, and they're ill-favored and lean-fleshed. So the idea is, is that they're not favored that well. It's ill, so it's a uh, bad type of cow, so to speak. Lean-fleshed, so very lean in the flesh, so skinny. And stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. So by the brink of the river, all right, this fat flesh here, and then the seven skinny ones, they stood right by this other kind at the brink of the river. And what did they do? Verse 4, and the ill-favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. That's quite a dream. So the ill-favored and lean flesh cows, the skinny ones, the ones that looked hungry and they were going to die, they ate up the seven fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. Usually you would wake up from a dream when some kind, of, uh, uh, some kind of exciting or dramatic moment in the dream, right? Something big that would shock you, right? So I'm sure when a skinny one eats a fat cow, that would shock you. And usually a shocking emotion would wake you up. So uh, why do you say that? Because <laughs> yours truly, whenever I'm stuck in, you ever got stuck in a dream? This is a side note. This ain't scriptural. Okay, so <laughs> you ever was stuck in a dream and you wanted to wake up and you just can't get up? Yeah. So then what I would do is I would try to find a very tall building to climb up and then jump off the building. And usually that works and I wake up after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to do something very shocking to get yourself to wake up. Like I told you,
you that is nothing Christian, nothing scriptural. Just a side note. Okay? <laughs> but relating to the text, usually something shocking would wake you up. Okay, that's the idea. <laughs> All right, verse 5. So then he sleeps again, right? Verse 5, and he slept and dreamed the second time. So he sleeps again and he dreams a second time. And behold, seven years of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. So notice right here, lo and behold, there are seven ears of corn. So thank God for yellow American corn. That's what we're thinking, right, when we read that? <laughs> During the BCs of Genesis, Egypt was growing corn, you know, before the, before the Native Americans. They came up on one stalk, and then it was rank, whatever rank is, and good. Now, you can see right here, there's a lot of incorrect English right here, so we need to modernize it. We need to change it. No, again, like I told you before, all you have to do is just look up in an old English dictionary, and it'll define you the word. So the ears of corn is obviously not the yellow corn, so I'm sorry to disappoint people who believe in the Mandela effect, but their favorite uh, verses are when you pull up the King James Bible word corn, and they'll say, see, somebody went back in time because they knew about corn, and then they changed the word in your King James Bible. Why? Because they want to corrupt everybody. So how they corrupt everybody? They just want to play with the word and put corn. Wow. Come on, man. Yeah. You would go that far, you know. Yeah. If I was malicious and I went back in time and I wanted to dabble with things, I, I wouldn't do corn, man. <laughs> I would do something else, man. Yeah. Uh, not, not corn. That's really silly, okay? It shows a, a lack of studying the Word of God. Yep. I mean, they, all they had to do was pull up a dictionary. So the corn right here is referring to wheat. Mm. It's referring to wheat. Now, if you look at John 12, it's pretty obvious right here when you look at John 12, that was referring to wheat when Jesus mentioned about corn. When you look at uh, John chapter 12, John chapter 12 and verse 24, John chapter 12, and then we'll look at verse 24. Now, this is so obvious. I mean, the King James Bible will sometimes define for you, too. Yeah. Right. You don't really need to pull up some kind of lexicon or sometimes a dictionary if you read the context or compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, look at John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. There you go. All right, now go back, all right? Yeah. See, so it's all before you. Now, you know what's really funny is that the Mandela Effect people will pull up this exact verse, John 12, 24, and prove to you that, oh, see, they messed with the word and they were talking about, you know, the yellow corn that we're eating today. No, silly, it's the corn of wheat. That should have been obvious to you. Yeah. Go back. All right, go back to Genesis chapter 41. So if you look that up, this is referring to the context of wheat right here. It's referring to wheat. Uh, when we look at the ear of corn, that's the same thing when you, uh, all you have to do is just type it out. It's so easy. The internet is free. Like ear of wheat, something like that, it will refer to that good part of the wheat. That's what it's referring to. All that top part, that good part of the wheat. So that's the idea about ear of corn. So just look up at an etymology online dictionary or even just type it out on Google search and then it'll pull it up for you. Now the idea about the word rank, what does rank mean? So rank is pretty much, another thing to know about archaic words is that all you have to do is just think about how we uh, modern people would use that word and then it would define for you. When we talk about rank, what would, it, what would it refer to? Like different levels, right? So when we talk about it's well ranked, it goes in well levels. It can go higher upper levels. So the idea about rank is that it's a superior level. That's what it means. It's a superior level. And the context of that wording shows rank and good. So that's... Yep. Pretty uh, obvious again. It should be pretty obvious. Yeah. So the King James Bible, when you're just simply looking at the context, it would define you the word. Mm -hmm. So just look at the context and look at a dictionary. 
and then read the whole verse again by context, and then you define the word yourself. Now, how do we uh, deal with these issues about the King James Bible? It'd be simpler if we just modernize the words. Now, here are several arguments that you want to note because you're going to deal with these people. And perhaps some of you have these questions. So write them down now because uh, I'll explain you the answers if you're having trouble with this. One is this. One, you have to understand that with the Word of God, you have to study, not just read it. Right. You have to study. That's what God requires from you. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So when people say, well, you know, it's, I just don't understand the words, and well, all you have to do is, it's so simple, just pick up a dictionary. And then it'll define the word for you. You don't even have to know Greek and Hebrew. Isn't it amazing that you have to have a Greek and Hebrew scholar and a full board of them who went through 10 years of university spending tens of thousands of dollars to make you a new Bible so that you can understand the word? Is really, that's, all, that's how much it takes, right? That much work, that much effort. No, all it takes is you just pick up an English dictionary and yeah. then you study for yourself and then you get the answer like that. 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But if you look at your modern Bible versions, they got rid of the word study. Yeah. How about that? How about that? See, they got rid of one of the most important tools of biblical hermeneutics. Biblical hermeneutics is so essential. It's one of my favorite topics, and I believe it's an advanced study for advanced people. But one of the keys of biblical hermeneutics is to study. You have to study for yourself. If you don't study, you won't know the answer. <clears throat> but the modern Bible versions got rid of that, which is why people can't find right doctrine or truth. Because they're not studying. They're going by tradition. They're going by, oh, that guy studied. So I'll listen to him or her. Mm -hmm. See, no different from the dark ages. No different from liberals today going to liberal universities. They blind obedience to what somebody tells them. Because they have a teacher or a credential behind them. I got one too. But you guys don't listen to me. <laughs> so does that mean anything? Of course not. You have to study for yourself. What a dumb thing, all right? All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Another argument to keep in mind, so then you need to study when it comes to archaic words. A second thing to understand is this. These words are not as archaic as you think. That's a second argument. These words may not be as archaic as you think. For example, we've talked about rank already. we talked about rank already. We even talked about ear. If you look it up in Google search, that's still a word that they use. In reference to wheat, actually. So if you saw ear of corn, you would know that it's not talking about some yellow corn. You would have known that it would be referring to wheat. So these words are still common. Uh, these words are still used in this modern day and age. And if we think about why do we, how do I use this word in my modern sense? What does it mean? then you can match that up with how they use it during the archaic times, and you'll see the meaning is pretty much the same. Uh, a good book is Archaic Words and the Authorized Version. It is a must-to-buy from Dr. Lawrence Vance. Archaic Words and the Authorized Version. Good reference to it. They, he pulls up every archaic word, gives you the history, a little bit of history, the meaning, but here's another thing. He proves how in a modern sense, how we use these words. Nice. And it's not as archaic as you think. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he even pulls up, so here's a third argument, all right? When they argue against archaic words in the King James Bible, guess what? There's archaic words in the modern versions too. Yes. You'd be so shocked. Mm -hmm. You'd be so shocked. I mean, <laughs> there's like one passage in Exodus. Uh, the King James Bible said they crossed the Red Sea. And then in some modern Bible versions, they say, wasap hashap, or something like that. And I kid you not, I'm not just exaggerating, it, it works it that way. And you go, why? Beats the fire out of me? You ask the scholar why. Yeah. They made it easy for you to understand. <laughs> Another one, 
the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. Modern Bible versions, they say Nephilim. Yeah. Now, unless you've been watching online and you're infatuated, then you know what that is. But to a common beginner, they're like, what is a Nephilim? Nephilim what? Well, the King James Bible makes it easier. Giants. Oh, I know what a giant is, says a five-year-old, all right? But ask a five-year-old what a Nephilim is, and they'll go, what? Yeah. And then ask them, which is easier, King James or NIV after that? Yeah. King James or modern Bible version after that? Yeah. So it's really silly. So uh, that book, again, archaic words in the authorized version, he pulls up modern Bible versions who will still use that same word that the KJV is using, or harder words that the modern Bible version is using, that the KJV makes it more simple. So, see, the argument about, well, the, we should have modern Bible versions because it's easier to understand, then the fifth argument goes, the fifth argument you want to add is, then when will it end? If we have a Bible by now where it's modernized, then why does it have to keep continuing? See? So, that one's not true. It doesn't justify modern Bible versions. About King James Bible's hard to understand, so I need to use modern Bible versions. That doesn't justify that, because modern Bible versions is endless. They keep on going. I guarantee you this, alright? Now, I hope I'm wrong, alright? I hope I'm wrong. But I bet you one million dollars, and I hope the Bible scholars are listening to this, all right? The Greek and Hebrew scholars, all right? I want them to prove me wrong. I'll bet you $1 million, all right? You guys aren't going to end this. Yeah. You're going to keep on going. Yeah. You're going to keep using Greek and Hebrew to correct certain words and verses. Another modern Bible version will be produced, all right? I bet you $1 million. And if I'm wrong, then you give me $1 million. Yeah. I hope they would prove me wrong. They won't. You know why? Money. That's money and their sinful nature. It's sinful nature. I mean, if they want to prove me wrong, then why not do it? They're risking something. They don't want it. It's part of their nature, their instinct. They have to. It's my living to always correct right. the word and give you my word. That should be eye-opening to anybody here who's listening to that. Amen. About modern Bible versions. Okay. The next argument to establish about archaic words is go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. The idea is this. If you got the pure, perfect word of God, I mean, this is, and there was a lot of sacrifice and tears for this. The best thing is to just enjoy the word of God and don't be nitpicky about certain words that you don't like. Just enjoy what you got. Yeah. You know, human nature is to always complain even if you're given something good. Yes. When you're given something good, you always complain. Look, uh, why not just leave it, the word alone, all right? Yeah. Big deal. You got the word of God, the precious word of God. Just enjoy what you got and leave it alone. Notice right here what the Bible shows right here with words that are no longer used. But it's not a big deal and they just leave it alone. 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, come and let us go to the seer. Yep. Mm -hmm. For he that is now, see, the modern word, called a prophet, yep. was before time, archaic, mm -hmm. called a what? Seer. Now look what uh, Saul did, okay? In verse 11. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young, maiden, young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the prophet... No, is oh. the what? Seer. Seer. Yeah. Oh, that's okay, Saul. Why would you... Because he don't make it a big deal. All right? He just left it alone. Now, here's the thing. If we live in an area that don't mind about making sure to using the right pronouns <laughs> and certain words to not offend people and they don't make a big deal about that, I don't understand why you're so nitpicky about the word of God more than some, more than some word that attributes to a man 
more so word that is connected to God, why don't you leave it alone too? Right. Why do you make a big deal about that? I mean, if using different pronouns don't affect, uh, using different pronouns, like, okay, you know, I, you know, I'll be sure to use the pronoun, the word that you like, and I'll just leave it alone. I won't make a big deal about that. If you live in that kind of stinking society today, I don't understand why they're mentally sick with those kind of words and pronouns. But when, when it comes to the word of God, I don't like that. I can't leave it alone. I want to use my word, stop. Oh, yeah. Stop, man. You're just making excuses. It's a human nature thing. Yep. Okay? All right, now, another one is, let's look at uh, Mark, Mark 9. Mark 9. Mark chapter 9. Now, here's another thing to think about. What some people don't realize is, let's pretend then the Word of God is simplified for you to understand. It's made to the modern language. It just suits you. My question to you is this. My question to you is that even if Jesus Christ spoke in your modern language, do you really think you're going to still understand? Look, you can simplify the Word of God, but you can't simplify the Word of God. God's Word, even if He speaks in your language, your modern language, up-to-date, whatever, and then He calls you bro, you know, or use jargon or whatever, is you still won't understand. Why? Because who can comprehend the mind of God? It takes studying, no matter what. You have to study, no matter what. How much He... Uh, how much he simplifies it, it'll never change the fact that you still have to study the Word of God. All right, we're going to look at the book of Mark, and uh, actually we're going to look at chapter 8. We'll go to chapter 8. I want you to go to chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and notice what Jesus said right here in uh, verse 15, Mark eight fifteen. And he charged them, saying, all right, now Jesus is speaking to them in their language, right? Mm -hmm. In their language. Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, why reason ye? Because ye have no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not, and do ye not remember? Verse 21, And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? So even Jesus spoke to their own language, their own modern sense, but they still could not understand it. Why? Because we're talking about the mind of God here. And when he speaks, no one can comprehend it, no matter how much he modernizes it to your level. It takes a spiritual understanding, not a fleshly understanding. That's good. But people want to make it a fleshly understanding. And they make fleshly men using fleshly credentials with fleshly means and fleshly tools to meet it at their own fleshly level so their fleshly brain and their fleshly mindset can, it can be understood to them. Don't make this book a fleshly book. This is a spiritual book, and yeah. it takes spiritual work and spiritual effort on your part to do it. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. Now that we understand about uh, the archaic or so-called archaic words in the King James Bible... We return to the main passage and continue the dream. 41, right? Yeah, 41, excuse me, thank you. Chapter 41, and then we will look at verse 6. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after him, uh, after them. So lo and behold, what happened is that the seven, there are seven thin years of, uh, of, of wheat. And what happened is there was a blast that came up out of seven thin years of corn, and the blast that came out of them is the east wind. It just sprung up. It just came out after them. So here he's looking in his dream, seven thin years of wheat, 
and then all of a sudden an east wind comes out of them. That's the idea, all right? It was a blast full of them. And the seven thin ears devoured, and seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So, again, seven thin years, and they were, this seven thin ears of wheat, they ate up the seven rank, the good level of wheat, and they were full as well. Pharaoh, he woke up due to that shock, and lo and behold, it was a dream. He found out. Now, before I continue on, I do want to cover the typologies of Christ, which I did not cover. So, we're going to look at the typology of Christ back at Genesis chapter 40, actually. So, at Genesis 40, remember, it was uh, the butler and the baker. Am I cut off? No. Okay, it's the butler and the baker with Joseph. And Joseph had to interpret the dreams for them. Throughout that story, we see, again, the rich nuggets of the typology of Christ from Joseph's life. First of all, go to Matthew 27, Matthew chapter 27. We'll look at verse 38. Look at Matthew chapter 27, and then we'll read verse 28. The first thing we notice is that there were two prisoners that accompanied Joseph. Jesus Christ had two prisoners who accompanied him when he, when he was treated as a prisoner as well, right? Two thieves. Remember that? All right, go to Matthew chapter 27, and then we'll read verse 38. Verse 38. The Bible says, Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3, and Luke 23. Galatians 3 and Luke 23. One got cursed and the other got restored. One got cursed and the other got restored. We're going to go to Galatians 3 and then Luke 23. So remember what happened to the butler, he got restored. What happened to the thief? On the cross who said, Lord, remember me. He got restored. He was remembered. Uh, the other thief, what happened? He got hanged on a tree. And that's how he ended his life. The baker hung on a tree as well. All right, Galatians chapter 3, he received a curse. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So Paul was referring to the crucifixion as well as the natural hanging. Yep. So the, the other thief or anybody who dies on the cross receives a curse. But the other person was restored. Luke 23, Luke chapter 23, what did he say? Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. At verse 42, right? At verse 42. What did Jesus say? Verse 43, he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He got restored. Okay, we're going to look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 and verse 28. Mark 15 and then we'll read verse 28. All right, what was Joseph doing? Joseph, he was actually uh, keeping count. He was serving the prisoners. He was numbered with the criminals. Jesus Christ was also numbered with the criminals. Look at Mark chapter 15. We'll look at verse 28. The Bible says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, And he was numbered with the transgressors. Joseph was also numbered uh, with the prisoners like Jesus. Uh, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. But the difference is... Even though Joseph was numbered with the criminals, he was innocent. He was innocent. Jesus Christ, even though he was numbered with the criminals, he was innocent. He was innocent. Isaiah chapter 53. Notice right here in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. The Bible says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. So he was treated as a criminal. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, 
and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was caught off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So he was uh, treated like a criminal, but notice right here, verse 7, he was innocent. He was always innocent. He did nothing wrong, like an innocent sheep, lamb to the slaughter. All right, another thing is that the wrath of the king fell on the criminals. The wrath of the king fell on the two criminals. All right, look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. The wrath of the king was upon the two criminals. So Pharaoh's wrath fell on the butler and the baker. Somehow he offend, uh, they offended him. We don't know the story, but they made him mad. He was full of wrath, and then he threw them into prison. Notice right here in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jesus Christ, when he was crucified and died on the cross, that... Uh, that part where he took on that criminal's death was God's wrath poured upon him. God's wrath poured upon him. So we were under the wrath of the king as well. You know that. When you are lost, you're under his wrath. That's why you burn in hell forever. Why? Hell is called wrath of God. I thought God is a God full of love. But if hell is called wrath, not love, that makes a lot of sense why he can keep the hell burning forever then. You have to understand that. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The Bible says, For he hath made him, God made Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took upon our sin so that we can receive his righteousness. Romans 1, Romans 1. We'll look at verse 18, Romans 1. And then we'll look at verse 18. Jesus Christ took our unrighteousness, took our sin, and gave us his righteousness. Because Jesus Christ, he took on the unrighteousness of lost people, which God's wrath has fallen upon. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay? We're going to look at uh, John 18. John 18. Joseph, he was bound. Remember that? Yes. Joseph, he was bound in chains and in fetters. So I showed that from the book of Psalm. If we look at John chapter 18, Jesus Christ was also bound. Jesus Christ was also bound. Look at John chapter 18. There's no doubt that the author, he was thinking about Jesus Christ when he wrote this. There are nuggets in Genesis that I've shown you. When we read that passage, we see so many pictures of Christ, Jesus Christ. Think about it. Uh, side note. Why do you think God, ever since when we all messed up, he started the typology in the picture when he killed the lamb? Yes. See, he was beginning a typology in Genesis. He was beginning a typology in Genesis. There is no doubt the author who wrote this book of Genesis, and I'm talking about the author, yeah. he, had the, he had Christ in mind. Yeah. He had Christ in mind. There is absolutely no doubt about it. This ain't just pulling stuff, us deliberately pulling stuff, finding stuff that matched, because the evidence is at the very beginning at Genesis 3, right. what God did to Adam and Eve. He clothed them with skins, and he did that for a reason. Why he gave a weird demand to Isaac. I want it to be sacrificed in this way and this manner. Why that way? He could have done a million other things. Joseph, he didn't have to go to Egypt bound. He didn't have to go through that whole ordeal. Unless God had a reason. See, you have to think about it that way. There is no doubt about this. There's a divine author here. Alright, look at John chapter 18 verse 12. John 18 verse 12. The Bible says, Then the band... And the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus, and notice right here, and bound him. And bound him. Uh, we're going to look at John 13. John 13. Joseph, he was serving the guilty. He was serving the prisoners. Remember that? At Genesis 40, he was taking the job for the warden. He was uh, helping him out. Jesus Christ also, in a sense, served the guilty. In John chapter 13, 
and then uh, we'll look at verses 1 through 13, John chapter 13. We'll look at verses 1 through 13. Notice right here, Jesus Christ at uh, verse 1. Jesus Christ, he knew that uh, he would have to love the people to the end. And then verse 2, uh, you know, Judas Iscariot goes out. Verse 3, Jesus Christ knows he's about to be crucified. Verse 4, then he starts to serve his disciples. Why? They're actually the guilty. They're actually the guilty. Because of verse 10. Verse 10. Jesus said to them, uh, Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, whit and ye are clean, but not all. So notice right here, Jesus Christ, when he was doing that, it was to their guilt, their sin, in a sense, to clean them, to clean them. It was to picture that when he was serving them. So John chapter 13, verses 1 through 13 is a great example of that. He was serving the guilty. We're going to look at Luke 24. Luke 24. Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. See, you have to think about this. Why would Jesus wash their feet? Never thought about that? Why would he do that service? There's a reason why. God makes a huge big deal on typologies. Why did God kick out Moses just for striking a rock? Come on. Because it was picturing Christ. See, God takes typologies very seriously. That's why God would have us go through some strange ordeals. Christ would do these strange things. God would do strange things because... They all picture a strong typology. And God takes typologies very seriously. He ruins his picture. Look at Luke chapter 24 and then verse 17. Luke chapter 24 and verse 17. Notice right here that uh, Joseph, he wanted to know why they were sad. Remember the butler and the baker, they were troubled, they were sad after they dreamed. So Joseph wanted to know why. Jesus did the same thing. Luke 24, 17. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these <coughs> that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? Jesus asked. Let's look at to Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Luke chapter 24 and verse 45. Uh, another thing is, uh, Joseph was able to give a, an infallible interpretation. He was able to give the right interpretation. Jesus Christ is able to give the infallible interpretation as well. Luke chapter 24 and then verse 45, the Bible says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. An infallible interpreter is Jesus Christ. Now here's something very, very interesting. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. All right, Jesus Christ, he took up uh, the bread and then the grape juice. In the butler's dream, he was serving grape juice. Yes. And in the baker's dream, he had baskets full of bread. Yeah. Now, don't tell me. Right. Don't tell me that this is us stretching things. That is some coincidence right there. Yeah. The author did that for a reason. Yes. That is strange stuff. All right, look at Matthew chapter 26, and then verse 26 through 27. Notice right here, the bread and grape juice involved, right? Okay, uh, we're going to, let's see right here. The 11th point, so then the 11th point, which I didn't write out, but Matthew 26 verse 29, Matthew 26, 29. The 11th point is that the wine of uh, Matthew 26 is the same wine as Genesis 40. It's grape juice. And there's, it's no doubt grape that's uh, pressed out. Verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this liquor, of this fermented hooch, of the, no, of this fruit of the vine. Just like the butler, he squeezed the grape and it pressed into the cup. There is no doubt, like I told you, I'm not going to do a whole class on that one, but like I told you before, it is common. It was natural that when they drank wine that time, wine was grape juice. Yeah. That was natural. All right, that was common. It's not an odd thing. All right, they think that liquor was more. 
liquor is a common one. That would make sense, not the grape juice. But we saw in Genesis 40 that Pharaoh, royalty, he drank that way. So it was common at that time. Okay, let's, uh, but I'm not going to expound on that. I already did that last time. Last Genesis study. All right, let's go to um, uh, Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 40. Now, uh, Joseph said, within three days, your, uh, within three days, you will be restored. That's what Joseph told the butler, right? Jesus Christ, within three days after the thief died, what happened? The thief was able to be restored and get up to paradise up there. Up there. Why? Because Jesus Christ, he went down into the heart of the earth where hell's located. And then three days later, he's able to take up paradise up there. So, uh, but that's a whole different doctrine. I'm not going to get on that one. So that's another interesting one. So the thief was restored three days later, just like the butler restored three days later. All right, Matthew chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 40. The Bible says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He had to be down there first before he went up there in heaven. Jesus Christ. Uh, another one, number 14. Uh, this is self-explanatory, but in Genesis chapter 40, verse 15, the Bible says Joseph is a Hebrew, right? What is Jesus Christ? He's a Hebrew. So, that's another typology there. You mean 12, right? What's that? You mean number 12, right? No, I'm in 14. 12 was the grapes, okay, pressed into the cup. 13 is the three days of the restoration. 14 is that uh, Jesus as Joseph is a Hebrew. Now we're 15, all right? This will be the last one. Ain't that a coincidence when we look at, uh, when we look at Galatians chapter 3? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. The one uh, who got hanged on the tree, the one who uh, didn't make it at the end, the baker matched with the unpenitent thief who didn't make it at the end and he ended his life hanging on a tree as well. So Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, which we read before. All right? So we've established all these uh, interesting parallels. Going back to Genesis 41 now. Going back to Genesis chapter 41. Let us continue reading the word of God. Verse 8, Genesis chapter 41, verse 8. The Bible says, and it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. So it just so happened that when the morning came, Pharaoh's, tribble was, uh, Pharaoh's spirit was greatly troubled. He was not at peace. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. So Pharaoh, he summoned all the magicians in Egypt. And all the wise men thereof. So all the wise men as well. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Self-explanatory. Pharaoh tells his dream to the wise men and the magicians, but none of them could interpret the dream to Pharaoh. Verse 9. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. So, all of a sudden, it had to take this incident, where no one could interpret the dream for the butler, and then he's like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Man, I wish someone could interpret the dream. Uh, yeah, man, these guys, they can't interpret that well. I wonder if there's someone smart enough who can interpret the dream. Oh, 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 I forgot, you know. That's like you, right? That's like you, you know, Jesus Christ saved your life. Oh. And then you're like, and then until some incident happened, and you're like, oh man, I wish that somebody could solve this problem. <laughs> oh man, why is this world so wicked? Yeah. Oh man, life is so unfair, you know. What can help me out right here? Oh, I'm so depressed. I, man, not, there's no hope for me out there. Uh, I've tried everything in the world, and no one could save me, and I tried... Oh, 
I remember when God saved me that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's us. Yeah. Freak. Human nature. Alright, alright. Alright, open your eyes, okay? You're that butler, man. And it takes you two years long to finally get something down to your head. So then, verse 9, the chief butler, he then spoke to Pharaoh, saying the words, Man, I remember my fault this day, so I remember my fault, my wrongdoing. That's what altar calls for. You're like, uh-huh, 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 oh, 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 yeah, uh, and then you go on the altar. You know what that is? I remember my fault this day. <laughs> That's what altar call is. All right, verse 10, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. Self-explanatory. Uh, the butler is trying to say to Pharaoh what happened. He said, uh, you, Pharaoh, were angry with your servants, which, was, which were me and the baker. And you put me in war in the captain of the guard's house. You put me in prison at his home, me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, and I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. What that means is he said that the chief baker and I, both of us, we dreamed a dream all at one night, me and him. Uh, each of us, according to our own interpretation of that dream, we dreamed. The idea is they dreamed it and they had their own interpretation of it. And it bothered them. They couldn't understand. They were trying to figure it out. That's the idea. Like some of you, sometimes when you dream something, it bothers you, and you're trying to interpret or figure it out, right? So it troubles you. Verse 12, and there, were, and there was there with us a young man in Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, did, he did interpret. All right, so remember how I explain it. See if it matches every word in the verse, and then you'd be surprised that you understand the Bible too, if you keep up like this, all right? So in verse 12, the butler saying, just so happened over there that there was a young man, he's a Hebrew. He's actually a servant to the captain of the guard. So he was helping out the captain of the guard. He was serving for him. And so we told him the dream, and then that Hebrew, that young man, Joseph, interpreted to both of us our dreams. He interpreted to each one of us accordingly to our dream and the interpretation that matched up along with that dream. Verse 13, And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto my office, and, and him he had. So it just, uh, verse 13, meaning it just so happened later on that Accordingly, as Joseph interpreted to us the dreams, it happened so it turned out that way. Me, Pharaoh, restored back to my office, and the banker, the Pharaoh helm. The Pharaoh helm. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh, he sent forth Joseph. He called him. He summoned him. They brought Joseph quickly out of the dungeon. When they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, Joseph shaved himself, and then he changed his clothing. And then he came to Pharaoh. All right, now, there's something interesting right here that, that I want you to think about. Uh... Joseph, notice right here, that he shaved himself. If you look up the word shave and it matches up, uh, it has to do with obviously a haircut, but also your beard, because that beard can be connected to your hair. Yep. So that's where we get the idea of shaving. Now, notice right here that it was common sense, even during the BCs, that if you're going to look presentable or respectable, that you needed to shave. So, uh, when there's some uh, Christians uh, whining about, well, I don't know why, I, at PBI they actually had a policy that you'd have to shave, actually. That's a policy. The reason why they did that was because during, they started during the older years, and during the older years, that hippie movement was coming out. Yep. 
So they were all growing beards and longer hair. So they made a big deal about uh, shaving. They made a big deal about shaving. So some people might argue and say, well, I don't get it. Why do we have to do that? Well, the re reason why is it's common sense if you want to look presentable in front of an important person that you shave. All right? People who act rebellious mode, they don't get the memo until they actually work at a high uppity up job. Yep. When they do that, then they get their common sense in there. They get their common sense sometimes too when they get in the military. Yeah. Well, I don't believe in this. I can dress, do whatever I want. No, man, they'll, they'll slap you silly. Yep. They'll slap you silly. They'll tell you the haircut that they want. They'll let you have the beard if they want to let you have the beard, or they'll shave it all off, whatever. They'll yeah. tell you the clothing that they want, and they want it folded the right way, too, just to teach you manners. Yeah. Wow. All right, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. It's a rebellious attitude to come out, I can come out the way that I want to church. All right, that's a big problem in churches. Yeah. If, you, if we're going to be... Uh, if we're going to be better than the business is, if we're going to be better than any, and if we present higher than any position in the world, because we're looking presentable for Jesus Christ, we're worshiping Jesus Christ, we want to come here to worship Him, you think that when you're coming to a worship service that you can dress as sloppy, but in a godless wor uh, working secular environment, you dress better? Oh. See, so that should be common sense to us. So you should be presentable. Then again, you look at Luke, uh, Leviticus 19. Then again, you look at Leviticus 19. Then you get the other side where they say, no, actually, what the Lord wants is that you leave your beard. Because you've got to be a male. So if you want to be a man, you've got to let the beard grow. That's what God wants. So then we look at Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 27. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 27. The Bible says, Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Now that's a good memory verse for hippies. All right, so <laughs> you can let the hair grow long and let the beard uh, grow long. All right. Now what's the simple answer to this? All right. So then uh, you get uh, Bible believers who can fuss about, you should have a beard, and those that say, you shouldn't have a beard. You know what the simple answer to that is? According to different cultures, they know what is presentable to them. Right. That's so important to understand. Okay, so uh, when I go to American churches, they got beards, okay? Why? Because you got to be a man, all right? Now, me, why do I shave? All right, this is a thing, all right? But in Korea, if I let my beard go out, they think you're lazy. Now, I was so tempted to have a beard because people always think that I'm a kid who's teaching online. And there's a lot of young preachers who grow beards. That way people don't get that stereotype, you're so young. That way you look older. How many times I was tempted to do that, but I can't because I'm a Korean. I go, man, do I have to be a Korean man? Why can I be white? So then I have to always shave it. Why? Because the Koreans who watch it will think I'm a lazy guy or I'm a sloppy Joe. Which is very true. So that's the reason why I always have to shave. If there's one person who wants to skip shaving, yeah, ask my wife. It is me. She's like, why don't you shave? And I'm like, because I'm not in church. Right? I can do what I want. You know? Why are we, when you go to fellowship, you can shave. I'm like, no, it's okay, all right? We're not worshiping God. So look, I get that, all right? I don't like shaving either. But the reason why I shave, I wear a monkey suit and then this clown tie is because I have to be presentable and it's a serious thing when I uh, present myself to the Lord and show to the Lord. Okay, And the world is watching me as well. And I have to present myself well to the Lord. So the idea is, whatever culture you're in, you got to dress the way where they know that what is presentable, what is respectful. So you have to dress that way. You have to dress that way. Hudson Taylor's time, you know, when they looked at the European style of dressing, the Chinese people, uh, Hudson Taylor knew that that would turn them off. He knew that to their culture, what would be presentable is he let the hair grow long. So then he had that uh, uh, pigtail, that long thing going out of his hair. And then he also wore Chinese dressing. He didn't have a tie or a suit on. That wasn't presentable to Chinese people. That turned them away. 
But he knew what was presentable to them was to dress that way. See, so the idea is, according to the culture, you know what the norm is on what is presentable over there. You know what is presentable. So that's why we believe, that's why we don't have legalistic dress codes. Why? Because we're not the Mormon church that, or the IFB church that has a hundred different rules telling you what's godly, what's not, when culture and times keep changing. And then different nations would dress differently. What we believe in is simply scriptural. What does the Bible say? What's presentable? Should be common sense then after that. With right. the Holy Spirit in you. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing, and I pray that the fellowship will go well for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.